This presentation will address identifying priority health issues in Australia. Quick look at the syllabus. It's important to notice there are five key aspects or factors to consider when identifying priority health issues, and they include social justice principles, priority population groups, prevalence of condition, potential for prevention and early intervention, and costs to the individual and the community. We're going to answer a range of questions, but basically we're going to learn about how we identify priority health issues, the role of social justice, and why is it important to prioritise. Now, Australia is one of the healthiest countries in the world. However, there are still a number of health problems that the population experiences. The challenge for the Australian government is to allocate a limited amount of resources to address these health problems. And this means priorities need to be established. So, Currently, we have nine national health priority areas, and they include cardiovascular disease, cancer, injury, mental health, diabetes, asthma, arthritis and musculoskeletal disorders, obesity, and dementia. Now, the Australian government has chosen to use a framework of priority health issues to achieve this. Epidemiology plays an important role, However, issues such as social justice, potential for prevention and costs are important in identifying these priority issues. Now, the Australian government has agreed that the nine health priority areas pose significant challenges to Australia. Each area has placed a significant burden on Australian society over a number of years. So the government says, let's prioritise. So they do so by educating by conducting further research, allocating funding, delivering campaigns to the community, developing new technology, and attempting to empower the community to take control of their own health. Now, determining priorities and health spending is very, very challenging. Different people in the community take different perspectives, but the Australian government has determined that along with epidemiology, the following considerations are important, and this can be used as a criteria. So the government will consider social justice principles, priority population groups, prevalence of condition, potential for prevention and early intervention, and costs to the individual and the community. Now the first part in the five point criteria is social justice. Now social justice principles include participation, equity, access, and rights. And these are particularly important because social justice means that the rights of all people in our community are considered in a fair and equitable manner. So it's all about fairness. Now, when we think about participation, it's all about empowering communities to act or involving the community to address their own health needs. Now, a great example of this is the national tobacco campaign, Break the Chain Initiative, which involves indigenous uh, people in the community trying to convince other indigenous people to quit smoking to reduce the prevalence of CBD and cancer in the population. So this particular campaign involves Indigenous people. It empowers them. It encourages them to go and speak to their other relatives and try to change their behaviours. So this is a great example of participation. There are many others out there. I encourage you to do some research. Equity involves the fair allocation of resources and entitlements without discrimination. And there are two types to consider. Vertical equity is providing health resources to those groups that need it most, such as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group. And horizontal equity involves providing resources across the population equally. Now, the Close the Gap initiative is, is implemented by the Australian government to try to reduce the life expectancy gap, infant mortality gap, increase access to early childhood education, improve literacy and numeracy levels and improve year 12 attainment levels and also improve employment in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. So this is a great example of vertical equity because a number of resources and extra funding has been applied to try to bring the level of Indigenous health up to the same level as the rest of the population. So that's vertical equity. Horizontal equity is about spreading resources across the entire population so that everybody has access. And a great example is Medicare, Australia's universal health insurance scheme. This is funded through the Medicare levy or, or tax, which is a 2% levy pay, placed on the taxable income of all Australians that, that work. Now, Medicare levy surcharge 
comes into place when a person earns more than $88,000. So clearly the whole population is contributing to this and this allows for access to health resources regardless of someone's circumstances. And that's horizontal equity. It's providing an opportunity for the entire population. Now access includes the availability of health services, information and education. So this is people acquiring or accessing services, hospitals and so on. Now it could be including more doctors in rural areas so that people can get checkups more regularly to reduce the cardiovascular disease uh, prevalence in those areas. The, the Royal Flying Doctor Service is another example of providing services to those that live in very remote areas. Again, increasing access to services. Medicare also increases access to services because you can then see a doctor using your Medicare card to get a checkup. It could also be increasing access through media. So campaigns spread across the community through television, through social media. It also could be providing messages in different language so that people of different um, nationalities can access these messages as well. So that's what access is all about. And providing more access can actually educate people. It can allow people to get more checkups and so on. And this can reduce the prevalence of some diseases. Rights is the fourth social justice principle, and this is about an entitlement to health care or basic education. And Medicare, again, provides that right. Every person has the right to go and access uh, their local GP. Uh, there's also a Commonwealth Seniors Health Card, which, again, allows more access to those of the elderly community. So it provides equitable opportunities for all individuals to achieve good health. So if the Australian government believes that a health issue can be controlled by addressing the social justice principles of participation, equity, access, and rights, then the issue will be made a priority. The second part of this five-point criteria is priority population groups. Now, there are a number of population groups in our society that are at greater risk of disease and illness. We've mentioned the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group. We've also got low SES or low socioeconomic status, rural and remote communities, the elderly community, overseas born and the disabled. Now if we look at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities again and we think about their life expectancy gap, it's about 10.6 for males and 9.4 for females. That's quite a large gap. So it means that more resources and funding need to be allocated to the ATSI community. So they're level of health can be brought up to the same level as the rest of the community. So clearly ATSI are a priority population group and there are a number of statistics there that tell the story. Again, we're seeing more statistics here for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group that show that they have seven times uh, the amount of kidney disease in their population and the rest of the community. Uh, diabetes, 3.3 times the rest of the community and the list goes on. And you can see that youth suicide is also very, very high. So again, a priority population group. Low SES are also a priority population group, and there are clear differences between low and high SES when it comes to health outcomes. Interesting statistic is the, the daily smoking rate of 23% for low SES versus 10% for high SES. And of course, we know that smoking contributes to a number of cancers and also cardiovascular disease. Rural and remote communities, the more remote an individual is, the more likely they are to experience disease and potentially um, a higher rate of, of death. And you can see in this particular graph that the more remote uh, communities are, the higher the death rate. Now, there are a number of risk factors for those that live in rural and remote communities. They're more likely to smoke on a daily basis, more likely to be obese, drink alcohol, be less active, and have high cholesterol. And they also are more likely to have a risky occupation. So clearly, rural and remote communities are a priority population group. Now, if the Australian government believes that the health issue can be controlled by meeting the needs of particular population groups, such as ATSI, low SES, rural and remote, overseas born, elderly and the disabled, then it's likely that the issue will be made a priority. The next step in the five-point criteria is prevalence of condition. Is there a high prevalence of the condition? This means how common is the condition? And if it is, then it's likely to become a priority. A lot of people in our community have cardiovascular disease, cancer, injury, dementia, and diabetes. And there are many others that are very 
common as well. So if, if a lot of people have the disease, then it's likely the government will say, let's make this a priority. If we look at cardiovascular disease a little more closely, we can see that circulatory disease, for example, 3.7 million people in Australia are affected by it. Heart disease, again, 1.1 million people are affected. So this is a disease that has a very high prevalence. So it makes good sense to allocate resources, funding, education, to try to lower this so that the community is better off. So if the Australian government determines that there is a high prevalence of condition, then the issue will be made a priority. Moving on to the next step in the five point criteria is the potential for prevention and early intervention. Now, if there is a potential for prevention of a particular disease or early intervention to reduce its impact, then it's likely the government will make this condition a priority. For example, exercise, diet, and GP checkups can help to prevent cardiovascular disease from developing. And likewise, screening can prevent certain cancers from developing. Now, Breast Screen Australia is a government initiative. Now, mammography is the recommended screening tool for the early detection of breast cancer. And women aged 50 to 74 are invited to undergo free mammograms. And this program uh, reduces breast cancer mortality, that's death, by up to 28%. So therefore, we can intervene quite early with breast cancer and save someone's life. So it makes sense to allocate funding towards that so that we don't have a big mortality rate. And we don't have a lot of people in hospital with advanced cancer. Now, if we have a look, um, if the Australian government believes that there is potential for prevention and early intervention through exercise, GP checkups, vaccination, diet and surgery, then it's likely that the issue will be made a priority. Now, the last factor in the five-point criteria is cost to the individuals and the community. Now, are there high costs to individuals and the community? Now, the government will need to consider this. Costs can be direct or indirect. They can be financial, physical, social, and emotional, and they affect individuals and the entire community. Now, direct costs is all about money. So in terms of an individual, it could be money spent on diagnosis, treatment, care, and prevention, but these costs can also be at a community level. So the costs estimated from medical services, the amount of people that are hospitalized and treated, uh, pharmaceutical prescriptions, prevention initiatives and campaigns, research, screening, and also education. This all costs money, and these are the direct costs of something like cardiovascular disease, for example. If it's costing the government a lot of money to treat, to put people in hospital, then it makes sense to put some strategies in place to reduce it and make it a priority. Now, you have a look at this graph, and you can see that um, cardiovascular disease at the top, you can see the green part of the top bar is hospitalizations. Now you can see that cardiovascular disease, it costs a lot of money to put people in hospital and treat it. Likewise for neoplasms, which is cancer, and also injuries. So you can see that hospitalizations cost a large amount of money. Now the government then sees this information and says, right, we need to make these particular health issues a priority so we can lower the costs. Now, there are also indirect costs. Now, indirect costs relate to things like uh, having days off work or absenteeism, uh, lost earnings for people, retraining of replacement workers. So these can also be individual and they can also affect uh, the community. So an individual that has CBD may have to take time off work. It may affect the family. It may um, affect relationships and so on. Uh, but it can also be at a community level. So... Insurance companies may be impacted, productivity in the workplace, support services may need to be developed to assist people that have these particular diseases. The workplace is affected and also wider communities are affected. So if the government believes uh, that health issues result in significant costs to individuals in the community that are direct or indirect, then the issue will be made a priority. Now, a quick summary it's important that you understand that there are five factors in identifying priority health issues, and this is part of the five-point criteria that was discussed within this presentation. You also need to be able to argue the case for why decisions are made about health priorities and consider questions such as, 
How do we identify priority health issues for Australia's health? Again, the five-point criteria is there to help you understand the how. And what role do the principles of social justice play? Participation, equity, access, and rights. And then finally, why is it important to prioritise? And consider the nine national health priority areas and why they are priorities. Thank you very much for listening.